Good morning, everyone. I'm Lynn Marsden Atlas, Executive Director of the Arthur Ross Gallery and University Curator, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you here today. Um, it's snowing outside. We're warm and cozy. As you can see, I'm in my Penn sweatshirt. I'm warm and cozy at home today. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Lynn Smith-Dolby. Lynn has been the registrar and the collections manager at the Office of the Curator for the Penn Art Collection since 2017. Previously, Lynn was the senior project manager of client services at Atelier Art Services, specializing in very complex art logistics for private collectors, museums, galleries, and auction houses. Lynn received her master's degree in the history of art from Tyler School, excuse me, of art at, at Temple University. And she has a special interest in American art from the Great Depression, especially New Deal artworks and early works from associated American artists. So Lynn is going to talk to us today about Thomas Hart Benton in the context of the current exhibition uh, many Voices, Many Visions. Lynn. Hi, Lynn. Thank you so much. And um, thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm looking at the attendees list, and um, I see that my art history professor from when I was an undergraduate is here on the call. And um, so I've got I've to live up to something here. <laughs> so thank you for joining, Suzanne. Um, but I want to talk to you today about the American artist Thomas Hart Benton and two prints that are in the exhibition, Many Voices, Many Visions, that were created during the time of the Great Depression. And I love that Lynn Marsden Atlas, who was the curator of the show, chose to include these works as part of the larger conversation in this exhibition about environmental um, and economic crises that many people faced during the Great Depression and are facing right now as a result of climate change and of course the pandemic. Um, but I wanted to start first with this amazing self-portrait from 1924 that I think Suzanne has up called um, Self-Portrait with Rita. Now this is not in the show. This is part of the collection at the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, DC. But um, I do love looking at self-portraits of artists because I think they give us a great insight into what the artist is trying to tell us about how they see themselves. So here we see the artist positioned at the very center of the composition. He's looking directly at us and he is towering over all of these other figures. Now in life, Benton was on the short side. He was 5'3", and he was often ridiculed for his height, but we wouldn't know that by looking at this portrait. Um, the figure that we see closest to us is Rita, um, who is Benton's wife. She was an artist herself and a former student of his, and she was an extremely important figure in his life. She was his cheerleader, his support system, but she was also incredibly business savvy and she functioned as his business manager. So this is obviously a beach scene. It makes sense that Benton shows himself as bare chested, but the National Portrait Gallery in their research on this piece notes that Benton at this time was really interested in Hollywood and movie star culture. And they suggest that he was influenced by Douglas Fairbanks Sr. in the 1924 movie, Thief of Baghdad. Suzanne, could you flip to the next slide, please? Okay, so I love this side by side. I think that Benton is definitely positioning himself as a heroic figure and like a bit of a heartthrob. Um, and this comes at a time in his career, so this is 1924, where he's really starting to like feel himself and come into the signature style, which is American regionalism. So from a young age, Benton had a sense that he was destined for greatness. And so I think we see him declaring that for everyone to see here. So this was painted at a time after he had returned to the United States after living and working in Paris in a very different style of work called synchromism, which he rejects completely and even declares himself an enemy of modernism. Next slide, please. Okay, so in this work from 1915, you can really see what Benton was playing around with. Um, the synchromous style focused on rhythms of color and the use of color as an abstract medium. 
And even though he eventually abandons the style, this use of color that we see in his later works, like the self-portrait, is really grounded in these earlier pieces. Next slide, please. Okay, so going back in time, Benton was born in Missouri and showed artistic inclination from a very early age, which was supported by his mother, but not his father, who expected that he would go into law and politics, which was the family tradition. His father was Colonel Massonius Benton. He was a U.S. congressman. And Thomas Hart Benton was named after his great uncle, who was a U.S. senator for the state of Missouri. So his father ships him off to military school for a brief stint um, that lasts for a year. Um, and then in 1907, his father relents and uh, Benton eventually enrolls in the Art Institute of Chicago. And I love these postcards that he sent home to his mother during this period of time. Clearly, he's an artist. Military school did not um, you know, affect that at all. Even in his correspondence, he's showing himself as an artist. Next slide, please. OK, so in 1930, Benton, who is not a big name at all, was commissioned to paint a 10 panel mural called America Today for a boardroom at the New School in New York City. And here we see a panel from that mural entitled Steel. So this figure that we see um, on the right side of the mural is who would later become Benton's most famous student. This is Jackson Pollock. He was an assistant on this project and he modeled uh, for many of the figures. But here we see Benton really embracing the signature style of American regionalism. This is art as storytelling. It's a figurative style with familiar subjects that are accessible to the general public. And this is really one of the first major American paintings to show working class Americans doing regular things, riding the subway, going to a prize fight, working, eating and drinking, dancing, et cetera. And Benton spent the years prior to this traveling around the country and creating thousands of drawings of the people and the places that he encountered. Um, this mural has a really interesting story. You can see it at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. They acquired it in 2012. Um, Benton was not compensated for this, um, but the materials were provided. And he said, um, I'll paint you a picture in tempera if you finance the eggs. <laughs> um, but he agreed to this commission, hoping that it would be a career boost. At this point, he was in his 40s and uh, was looking to make a name for himself. So next slide, please. All right, so here's an image that shows the view of the mural. And I wanted to bring your attention in particular to the panel above the doorway that I've blown up um, at the top of the slide. So in the midst of these images of a sort of carefree life in New York City during prohibition, Benton has given us this presage of what's to come. It's the very beginning of the Great Depression. And so above this portal, he shows these disembodied bony hands grabbing for coffee and bread. Right, next slide, please. So this brings us to the very first artwork in the exhibition. This is a small lithograph. It's about nine by 11, entitled Going Home. Um, this was published by Associated American Artists, which was a New York gallery founded in the 1930s with the mission of making art available to everyday people. Now, the business model was completely new. Um, artists would be paid in advance to create the plate, and then um, a limited number of prints would be sold via mail order from between $5 to $10. Um, Thomas Hart Benton was one of the original artists making work for Associated American Artists, which makes sense. Their missions were completely aligned. Um, Benton was very vocal in his rejection of art that he found to be too intellectual. Um, his sister said that he, uh, quote, wanted to make art for people who read the funny papers. Um, so he championed this idea that art should exist outside of the museum. And his regionalist style was extremely marketable and appealing to consumers at this time as a way to create a sort of romantic vision of America and a way to boost morale. Um, at this point, Benton had left New York. Um, he had become completely disillusioned with the New York art scene, and he moves back to Missouri. So when Benton was traveling around the country prior to his America Today mural, um, this is a scene that he encountered on the road in North Carolina. Um, the print itself um, comes with a description from the artist saying, from a drawing made, 1928 in North Carolina, Smoky Mountain country. With a companion driving the car, I followed these hill people till the drawing was finished. 
So witnessing this very intimate moment as we watch these people at dusk driving along a country road, um, we see the horse and driver from behind, but the two children are sitting facing us. Clearly having had a long day, their eyes are closed. They're both leaning their heads to the side to take a rest. They're barefoot, wearing very simple clothing and traveling by a horse-drawn wagon. And all of this gives us a sense of who they are. Benton has even described them as hill people. So he tethers them to the landscape with this very term. Um, and this goes back to this idea of artwork that tells a story and this very familiar subject for all of us of children falling asleep on the way home after a long day. And even though we get a sense that these are not people of means, he's not asking us to feel sorry for them. He's showing us their life as it is. And this very cozy scene about family and connection that maybe allows the viewer to transcend their very real worries or anxieties about money. All right, next slide, please. So from January to February, 1937, um, the Ohio River flooded and caused major destruction across the Midwestern states. It left about a million people homeless and caused billions of dollars in damage by today's currency. Um, right now we're living through a hundred year virus. Well, this was a hundred year flood and the damage was just relentless. So this was 1937, we're in the midst of the Great Depression and this flood really added additional strain to federal resources. So what we're looking at now are images of what the floods looked like in Midwestern American cities. Um, on the left, we see a fellow um, rowing a boat in downtown Cincinnati. And on the right, what New Albany, Indiana looked like. Next slide, please. I also found this photograph of a rooftop peeking above the water, just to give you a sense of how deep the water was in places. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so now we see the artist's interpretation of this incredible environmental catastrophe. Um, this is Flood, also on view in the exhibition, and again, a print that was distributed by Associated American Artists. Here, Benton has invited us um, to another very intimate moment where two women are surveying the damage to what we can only assume is their property. And like the previous photograph, we see rooftops visible above the flooded water. The sky is dark and stormy, and there's almost a feeling of anticipation that maybe more damage might be coming. Benton has done an interesting thing here with the composition by placing groups of two. So we've got these two women, these two trees in the middle ground, and then these two buildings beyond. And the shapes of the women, especially the woman closest to us, who was sort of hunched over and reliant on a cane um, is echoed in the shapes of the trees. So again, this linking of people with landscape. And as we saw in the previous photograph, the trees actually did look like this. The flood happened in January, but there's this added symbolism of what has been lost in the flood. And of course, this idea of roots. Um, of course, agriculture is such an important part of the culture of the Midwest. And it's interesting to me that Benton chose to show two women in the scene. Um, maybe even as a way of highlighting the labor and contribution of rural women whose work on farms overlapped with those of men, but was often overlooked. These women show a strength and a resolve. And by including them in this scene, he emphasizes the human cost of this tragedy. Um, oh my gosh, I think I've gone over for one minute. These talks go so fast. <laughs> Um, but I wanted to end by saying thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, um, real greatly. <laughs> thank you um, Suzanne Seisman, for setting this up and for running the slides. And um, I miss, really miss seeing everyone in the gallery. And um, I miss the insomnia cookies that we, we usually have to accompany these talks. Um, but if you're local, I hope you'll get a chance to see the show. And if not, we're working on an online version um, for everyone that should be up soon. So please let us know if you have any questions. Go. Lynn, can you um, see the question in the chat? Yes, I'm looking at the chat right now. Okay, great. Okay, so um, Heather asks, how would someone of Benton's days have purchased one of these prints and where would they buy them? So Associated American Artists um, sold prints through mail order and they were advertised in popular magazines next to other consumer products as a way to make them like really accessible. Um, they also shifted their business model 
um, for a few years um, to sell these prints at um, department stores. So people would pick them up at department stores, but mail order was the way that they were sold mostly. And again, they were between five to $10, depending on whether or not you wanted them framed. So really made things accessible to, to everyday people. All right. Well, I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, unless there's any more questions, you can always feel free to find me through um, um, our, our website, um, our collection.upenn.edu. There's a contact module um, where you can email us directly any questions that might come up for you. But I really appreciate everyone joining and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if you can hear oh, me. Yeah, I can. Oh, great. Um, will this be available uh, to re-listen to? I, yes, I think it's being recorded. So um, yeah, right. we'll put it on the that. website. You can revisit it. That's great. Thank you. This was wonderful. Oh, thank you so much. And, uh, one more thing. How long will this be up in the gallery, this exhibit? The exhibition um, is up until March 28th. Great. Thank we have you. a little bit of time. Thank you. Hi, this is Linda. I have a, a, a question, Hi, if there's Linda. still time. Yeah, of course. Um, so uh, you mentioned that Benton left New York because she wasn't happy with the art scene, which I find surprising because this was a time when you were having a real influx of people coming in from Europe who were coming as um, refugees. And it was a very vibrant um, art scene at that time. Do you know what it was that he was not happy with? Yeah, you know, he he completely rejects the sort of popular style of work at that time. Um, so, you know, the earlier work that he, that he was producing when he was in Paris was sort of what was in vogue at that time. And um, he decided that he didn't, want, he didn't want to work that way anymore. He became sort of um, disillusioned by people who he felt really just couldn't draw and didn't have the like chops for, you know, lack of a better word for um, making artwork. Um, he felt like his work was um, not being respected there. And so he moved back to Missouri. And, you know, he sort of existed, I think, between these, between these worlds, because I think he went back to Missouri and he wasn't exactly, um, he was like an outsider everywhere in a way, right? Because um, in Missouri, he was seen as someone who, you know, he showed up after living and working in Paris with like a walking stick and like, you know, dressed in these like Parisian um, clothes. So, He's an interesting, he's an interesting character. Um, there's a, an excellent documentary that I revisited on Thomas Hart Benton by Ken Burns. Um, it's one of Ken Burns' early pieces. It's like from 1989. And um, it's an interesting, it's interesting to revisit that because Benton's work, I think at that time in the late 1980s was considered kind of kitsch. And it wasn't, um, it, um, to, to say that, um, and you were an art critic and you liked Benton's work was like wildly unpopular at that time. And there are art critics who are interviewed by Ken Burns who just like, you know, are brutal um, in their, their assessment of Benton's work. Um, and so I think, you know, Benton was, you know, getting that kind of feedback even during that time. Okay, great, thank you so much everyone.